Hello, and welcome back to our, our last kind of formal session for the day. Um, we do have a, a kind of more informal session of wonder to close our day out, but this is our last kind of formal session. And for this session, we actually have a panel of folks who are going to be talking about FreeBSD and ARM64. So I'm going to turn it over to Sabina from Clara to introduce the rest of the folks on the panel. Thanks, and I'm, I'm somewhat amused to hear that we're a formal session because we very much wanted to avoid that. Like our, our aim here was, and you know, good morning, good afternoon, and whatever time appropriate greetings might fit. Um, the point of this talk was to kind of, you know, we weren't able to meet in person this year yet again, with the promise of a better 2021 failed us all because we were told, you know, we get vaccinated and we can all get together in person and here we are for yet another Zoom session. But what we try to do is make it a little bit more interactive. So we brought here um, very, very knowledgeable people on ARM, very knowledgeable people on FreeBSD. We brought everybody together to kind of have a lively conversation on FreeBSD running on ARM architectures. Why is this important? And let's just ignore the reading slides. We're going to kind of guide the conversation with the slides, but I'm going to focus more on the speakers than just content. So I want to introduce I went a bit fast here. I want to introduce our panel. So you have me, you have Alan, which we probably know from previous talks. We have Andy Waffa. Hi, Andy. And we have Sean Varley from Ampere Computing. And that's it. We're going we're gonna to start this. We only have half an hour. So Andy, I'm going to start with you. Um, you're the best person to ask, why do you think ARM is a necessary disruption, and again, don't laugh at the word, in the server space. What does it bring that x86 does not? I think you it need to the unmute. <laughs> yeah, I've tri triple muted, um, just for redundancy. Um, so in the server space, our, you know, the server space has evolved. Um, over the last eight years since we started entering um, into it. And one of the value adds at the time was uh, variety choice, um, removing the single vendor lock-in uh, aspect from hardware. Um, as time has moved on, um, many of those vendors that we did have that were ARM licensees have moved on. Um, but what we now have are the hyperscalers that are uh, picking up, becoming their own silicon vendors effectively. You know, Amazon has done a fantastic job with the Graviton um, family, uh, and they are seeing significant um, performance benefits over uh, existing architectures. Uh, or previous architectures that they've had. Uh, and so competition is always good. It helps um, the incumbents to innovate, helps to keep them on their toes. Um, you know, it, it's everyone always looks at Linux as, a, as an OS. FreeBSD is just as capable. Um, and it actually keeps the Linux community on its toes. The same sort of thing goes from an ARM, uh, you know, from a silicon perspective. We are there not only to provide a viable alternative, um, but we're also there to ensure that there is an even playing field. That makes sense. And I will probably come back to you on the how do we challenge the Linux space in like one slide or two. Um, sure. Alan, my next question is for you, and I'm just being mindful of time. Um, how can the FreeBSD community benefit from supporting the architecture? Like, you know, Andy made a very good point about how it's good to have competition and it's good how to have options, but how can specifically the community take advantage of this? Well, yeah, like when industry shifts uh, to a new platform like this, uh, they can it's, it's a chance for them to reevaluate all their decisions, and one of those being which OS to use. Uh, and if, you know, when FreeBSD is there as an option early rather than showing up late to the party, like we've I've done on some past architectures, means that 
we have this chance to get in with new people and in new verticals that we haven't been in before, uh, but also to bring the unique things that FreeBSD provides uh, to those platforms early. You know, one of the advantages with ARM is uh, it's easier for a vendor to, to basically like Amazon has customized the processor to have specifically the features they need or to have extra offloads for their most uh, important workload. Uh, and the fact that FreeBSD has a lot of systems that can take advantage of that type of uh, specialization uh, means it's, it gives them more of the building blocks to build whatever their platform is going to be. Uh, you know, Morello is a very uh, interesting example with that where, you know, when that starts shipping next year, FreeBSD will be the only option. Uh, and that might lead to a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, and then, you know, as much of that as we can to, to capitalize on the fact that FreeBSD is arriving early on ARM64 and, you know, as people are migrating to it, they have a chance to actually, we have a chance to show off what makes FreeBSD different and better uh, and where our strengths are uh, to people that, you know, hadn't considered it because on the traditional platforms, Linux was just the easy answer. Would you make a point about licensing when it comes to unique features? Yeah, for sure. You know, a lot of, of it, you know, the reason why people are building their own custom processors is because they want to control the stack top to bottom. And, you know, the FreeBSD license makes that uh, a lot more palatable than, than something Linux related. That makes sense. So, you know, you've mentioned some of the features that are absolutely worth knowing. Let's take, let's go on a bit of a deeper dive. So we as Clara, we've done some work to enable FreeBSD on ARM. One of these features, we see it on a slide as well as Crypto and KTLS performance on ARM V8. Uh, can you expand a bit more on the work that was done and why that's important? Yeah, so when we first uh, got access to the ARM V8 reference platform, uh, and we hooked it up with a pair of, of Mellanox dual 100 gig cards and started playing with it. We were, because it wasn't taking advantage of the, the crypto offload on the CPU, we were only getting about 33 gigabits per second across those four cards. But when we went and implemented uh, AES GCM in the ARMv8 crypto framework and got that hooked up through OCF and uh, did a bunch of other improvements there uh, and uh, fix some bugs that were specific to ARM in the KTLS code and got all that going. We were pushing over 210 gigabits per second uh, out of that same platform with just uh, a couple of commits to FreeBSD unlocking all of that. Is this um, a good time to show our slide? Sure. Okay. Um, the other interesting one, like Andy was saying, is when we looked at other algorithms, it's, it's not as commonly used for uh, SSL, but uh, AES CBC out of the box was significantly faster on ARM than the kind of comparison x86 machines we were using as traffic generators. You know, in the end, we get about the same performance as we saw on the x86 boxes uh, after our work, but with some of the other algorithms, the ARM was 30 to 50 percent faster uh, before we started improving the, the KTLS framework uh, to take better advantage of that. Can you walk us a bit through this graph? So, because, you know, it's a bit out of the blue. So can you tell us without going into too many specific details, going from left to right? Yeah, uh, so the first one is just when we started, we installed FreeBSD head on the machine and, and tried it out and we were getting about 33 gigabits per second. Uh, but the main thing was we were not taking advantage of the, the basically the equivalent of AES and I on, uh, ARM. Uh, so with the work to enable ASGCM offload uh, with the ARMv8 crypto um, module in FreeBSD, suddenly we got a lot more performance as we were taking advantage of those features on the CPU. Uh, but we were still hitting some bottlenecks uh, because of the way KTLS worked or and also just some of the um, machine-specific code for ARM. Uh, like one of the things uh, Mark found when doing the work was that um, there was just an if def that said, oh, if this is ARM64, uh, you know, the buffer cache should never be too big uh, because ARM64 is these little SPCs like Raspberry Pi, right? It's, it's never going to have 256 gigs of RAM in it. Uh, and it's like, well, that's not actually true anymore. Uh, and so changing uh, those and improving those helped a lot. And uh, like Alexander found that 
uh, we were allocating interrupts and there was not allocating enough of them. Um, but we had to do that in a way that we wouldn't allocate way too many for the, the, the small machines, but at the same time being able to do it for the large machines and just trying to make FreeBSD scale both up and down, depending on the size of the machine. And I'd argue trying that to do that without requiring separate kernels. Yeah, I'd argue that there's something to be said about synergy between great hardware and great software. And I think this is a very, very good example of it. And so as you can tune through your software a way in which you can really make use of your hardware. Like the, that's, that's how I read this graph. Um, speaking of the general scaling and so other, other how, how others, apologies, how can you make use of, or how can you leverage FreeBSD? Sean, I'm gonna turn the conversation a bit to you. You know, you're on the Ampere side, you're a consumer of an operating system in the end. The hardware is important for you, but operating systems as well. How do you see Ampere leveraging FreeBSD? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Sabina. The, uh, this is a really interesting question. Um, I kind of want to go back a little bit to what Alan was saying. You know, first off, you have to start with the fact that uh, we're putting uh, together essentially a very disruptive product for the cloud uh, in general, and and uh, from you know the scaling um, you know aspects uh, that that uh, Alan was mentioning around number of interrupts. You know, a large machine is 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 you know like an Ampere platform with 80 or 128 cores on it. And you know, uh, heretofore that hasn't necessarily been uh, an available platform for the marketplace, right? And so, what one of the things that we're discovering a lot is that uh, you know a lot of software just really wasn't written for this kind of scale in a socket. And uh, we've we've encountered numerous um, you know kind of uh, cases where where uh, you know benchmarks have been written for the legacy architecture. Um, and uh, they don't they don't necessarily run very well out of the box, and so you have to go tune them. And one of the things I, I think is super compelling about the FreeBSD ecosystem is is is, is really that this started it's, it has roots as as a developer uh, platform, right? Uh, a lot of developers, you know, love it for uh, you know its flexibility and, and the um, you know the, their their ability essentially to mold it into what they want it to be and in this case uh, i think as you said sabina this is a this is a, a opportunity to kind of co-evolve uh the hardware along with the software and we're we're giving you know people access to this sort of groundbreaking um you know platform that allows uh people to scale to pre you know uh, previously an unforeseen uh you know kinds of performance uh, given that you have, you know, up to 128 in our current ultra max generation cores uh, running in in single threaded uh, in a single threaded mode at a consistent frequency, which gives you very, very predictable performance and all of these, you know, uh, operating system uh, uh, you know, conveniences features that are, you know, sometimes taken for granted, uh, you know, net, definitely need to be rethought. And certainly when you get to the application layer and, and running the applications, you know, in this type of an environment, it, there definitely needs to be some, some, uh, you know, uh, pre-thought put into how you would run these kinds of, of workloads uh, now with this, with this capability. So, so yeah, I, I like to come back to that idea of co-evolution and, uh, and I think there's a really, really good match with the free BSD ecosystem and the developer uh, you know, community that surrounds it. I think the way you end that sentence gives me the perfect lead into the next topic, which is uh, marketizing, productizing. Like, you know, every great platform, every great OS needs to be used by others. Otherwise, you know, it dies in a basement like many other great products. The Ultra definitely doesn't suffer from any of that. But my question is, how can we expand the market together? And this is a question to the whole panel. Market opportunities. How do you think buyers, vendors, anybody can leverage the use of FreeBSD on ARM. How would you see this market expanding? How do you see potential buyers making use of these two together? And I'm going to call on Andy first because I haven't heard him in a while. Um, so there are multiple um, avenues to, to leverage FreeBSD. You know, the, the simplistic one is the um permissiveness of freebsd right um 
there are certain segments that are very copy left averse. Uh, and as a result, uh, you know, OSs like Linux are kind of the uh, boogeyman as far as they're concerned, right? Um, and that leaves uh, an open door for FreeBSD to uh, work in there. From a technical perspective, the way that FreeBSD is architected compared to the likes of Linux um, is also a huge um, benefit. It's a very flat structure. Um, you know, you you take ownership for your code, you break it, you fix it, right? Um, there is no um, parent there to help clean up after your mess and, and whatnot uh, kind of thing. You just need to roll your sleeves up and get on with it. You know, everyone's grown up, so uh, it's all good. Um, and I, you know, unbiasedly, I think that actually as a, as a community, it seems that it's a much more, it feels like a much younger environment to work in, right? It's almost like a startup community, whereas Linux is very old and, you know, kind of crusty and full of gray beards. Um, and I think, you know, when you're looking at engaging with the community, to help further your product along, having that flexibility and that um, teenage enthusiasm almost, uh, and this is coming from people that are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, it still comes across as that sort of teenage enthusiasm, um, actually provides a, a lot of um, fuel to help build a product. Yeah, and I think having all the pieces together in one place, including all the bits you need to customize it, uh, is just a lot easier than if you look at trying to, to customize it on other platforms. You're, you're you know, pulling this version of that component and this version of that component and trying to juggle it all and, and try to update the components in ways that's not going to break with the other components. Whereas with FreeBSD, it's, it's kind of all under one roof and it, it kind of takes a step forward all at once and means that you don't get as much of this kind of churn related to just trying to keep all the components working together. And I think it's something we also witnessed uh, when we started working with, with Ampere and Sean, I'm going to come to you in a second. Um, you know, there's a certain energy with also the arm space. It's a far newer company, right? There's far less rules. There's far less, you have to do it this way or this with this other way. There's far less, you know, specific vendors that people go to. So we end up ourselves, not the biggest company by a long shot that's doing open source development. And we're pairing up with, with Ampere on something that, you know, needs to be delivered by, next week and we have this, this sense of we're, de we're delivering something for the future. We're delivering something that, you know, Sean used this word, er, word earlier, disruptive. So Sean, if, you know, consider that our audience might, in our audience, there might be customers that might be interested in moving from x86 to ARM. How would you tell them that this synergy between how FreeBSD runs on the Ultra makes sense to them? Yeah, I'm going to come back to a couple of things and uh, maybe tie it back into what Andy was also saying. And, and so the first thing was agility, right? That I heard, and 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 the agility of uh, from from all of you guys is 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 one of the opportunities here, right? Um, the and I interpret kind of Andy's sort of graybeard analogy to you know there are a lot of rules and there's you know if you have to backport you know commercial Linux kernels and things like that, it's 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 a I'm not going to lie, it's a pain, right? Um, and we all kind of know that. And, and when you're on the forefront of, of creating a new, um, you know, hardware architecture, this gets somewhat cumbersome, right? And uh, we're on the front end of this, right? We are putting out, uh, you know, really groundbreaking disruptive platforms for the future cloud. If you heard Renee, our fearless leader at, at OCP, some of you may have, you know, she really talked about the next 10 years of cloud evolution. And, and we are supplying the platform that allows us. We're not the third choice behind AMD and Intel. We are a different choice, 
we're a disruptive choice. If you want to go down this path with us, and I think the free BSD ecosystem is uniquely positioned to kind of um, grab on, use that agility to create the next set of born in cloud applications that take advantage of this in infrastructure. And uh, I like also what Andy said about, you know, you kind of own it, right? You can own this future, but the, two, the combination of, of these types of products uh, from a hardware perspective and the, uh, an OS as agile and open and uh, you know, kind of bring your innovation uh, like FreeBSD, this can be a really, really good pairing to, you know, creating the next Netflix or creating the next Twitter or, you know, whatever is going to come on down the line in the future in this, you know, kind of brave new cloud world. I think I agree with you. It's definitely um, another way to do things rather than, you know, yet another option on the market. It's not even a reinvention. It's the next level. I mean, what, whilst things are all good um, and kind of onto <laughs> almost preempting your slide there, Sweden, the, <laughs> you know, there are plenty of warts um, around. So, you know, let, let's not, imagine that we're just looking at it through roast into glasses there are some real ugly lumpy bits um that do hinder some people wanting to take freebsd on uh into their product um i don't know if you wanted to say anything to no and you know i i just want to tell the audience we haven't rehearsed this presentation so you know you <laughs> pass it straight on the ugly is more than I could have asked for. So go ahead, all yours. There is um, something to be said for having something that is relatively simple and easy to take on, right? Um, I'll admit when I first started looking at, you know, getting the FreeBSD community engaged on ARM and, and, and working closer with the FreeBSD community, first step was, okay, let's bring FreeBSD up, let's play around with it. It wasn't easy, right? Um, at the time, I was still an engineer. I was still actually, you know, fingers on keyboard and doing some form of code rather than PowerPoint and, and documents and all that spreadsheet nonsense that I do now. Um, so there is something to be said for how clunky bringing FreeBSD up can be, right? Um, it's it's not the simplest and it does put people off. Um, you know, the fact that it's easier to find information to uh, on how to work with Linux to, on, you know, to productize something using Linux. There's loads of resources available out there. There's not as many for FreeBSD. Part of that is because FreeBSD free is not as um, big um, commercially, shall we say, as, as Linux in some places. Um, but it's one of those hurdles that needs to be addressed uh, to ensure that the community stays vibrant, both from a, a regular developer community, but also for com from a commercial community, um, you know, Linux is where it's at because there's a lot of companies involved. It's just part of the, the way of life. So we need to try and get some of, you know, more of those companies into the community here. Um, and to do that, they want to be able to run it as a product. It needs to be simple enough for them to run it as a product. Well, there needs to be sufficient training opportunities for them uh, to lower that barrier to entry. Yeah, I know you've uh, talked a bit before about having better onboarding for new developers so that when people are trying to, you know, investigate bringing up FreeBSD that they can get up to speed more easily, but also just what can the project do to better onboard vendors? So if someone, if a vendor is interested in considering FreeBSD, how can we help get them up to speed and give them the information they need and the answers they need? Um, and even just make it obvious to them that that's uh, available, that there's people they can talk to and not just, you know, they Google for it, they don't find something and they, they move on kind of thing. And so we kind of have to attack it from every direction. We have to have established documentation for it. We have to have go-to people for it. We have to have all the 
the things to help capture that interest and and you know once once you get people up to speed on FreeBSD, they're usually pretty hooked. Uh, but we have to get them over that hump uh, in the beginning. Otherwise, you know, it, they just bounce off and and go somewhere else. Sean, from what you can see and tell, and from our interaction in the past year or so, how do you feel? FreeBSD could be better. How can it help you more, you as Ampere? Yeah, I'm going to come back to the resources, um, you know, part of this. Like, uh, you know, it, it isn't as easy to find, um, you know, the things that you don't have, right? And uh, one of the bad or maybe the ugly things about, you know, a new platform, you know, like uh, Ultra and use, utilizing the ARM cores is that not everything is out there for it, right? Um, there you encounter the libraries that are not, um, you know, either compiled or optimized for for this architecture. Um, I mentioned earlier some of the availability. Actually, uh, I found uh, the the crypto uh, example that Alan shared very very um, poignant, right? That is one of you know several things that you could encounter where you plug in something that just should work. And, and it doesn't, right? Or it doesn't work the way you thought it should. And, uh, and so, you know, these sorts of things are, are part of what we, uh, actually my team inside of Ampere is, is really kind of um, you know, geared and built to do, which is enable uh, ecosystems like the FreeBSD ecosystem to, to, to do better and, to, um, and then be able to um, provide that megaphone to the community, right? So, uh, I'm going to put this out there in this particular uh, conference. You know, I welcome the FreeBSD community to come and uh, and show their work. Uh, we have uh, solutions.amperecomputing.com, which basically shows what works uh, on on our processing platform. And uh, we we are remiss in getting some of the FreeBSD stuff up there. And I'd love to see it get um, you know expanded and expounded upon. Um, and that's part and parcel to you know having that full full menu, right, uh, to, to choose from when you start working with an OS. Yeah, and I'd say, you know, on the good side, the projects you got ARM up to tier one, and the ports team has done a great job of getting a lot of the common applications working and, and not just marked as x86 only anymore. Uh, but we still don't have a latest package set uh, for 13 for ARM that's updated on a regular basis. And a lot of applications aren't always taking advantage of some of the CPU features that are available out of the box. Uh, so I think one that still kind of persists is the the OpenSSL that's included in base. If so, if you just log into one of these Ampere boxes and run OpenSSL speed, the results you get for AES, GCM, and so on are significantly worse than if you run that same thing on Linux. If you install OpenSSL from ports and it, you know, builds it specifically for your machine and and takes advantage of all the, the bits that are there in OpenSSL, then you can keep up. But the, uh, the you know, out of the box FreeBSD looks like it underperforms when it's, you know, a couple of compiler flags just need to be fixed in the build of OpenSSL and base and things like that. You know, I'm, I'm getting messages in the chat telling me you have to give up in 30 seconds. So somebody needs to say one last word on this and why it's important. And, you know, I'm going to say thank you to, the, to everybody that watched, but one last word, why is this important? Um, Andy. Um, choice. Uh, I, I want um, people to be able to choose ARM uh, and I want them to have the choice of operating systems, communities to engage with uh, on our architecture. Um, you know, we, we have multiple um, partners uh, and, you know, Ampere is a fantastic partner and we love working with them, um, but they're not the only ones. Uh, but I, you know, Ampere is driving in the cloud. We have uh, other partners that are looking at different areas, um, you know, robotics, automotive, uh, you know, medical, you name it. Um, and I want to see FreeBSD um, work from, uh, you know, your, your smartwatch all the way through up to the cloud that's powering the data that's going through to your smartwatch. It's a perfect way to end. And before I turn into a pumpkin, I think I'll 
thank you, Sean, Andy. You've made this panel far more interesting than Ellen and I could have ever done it. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And I'll hand it over back to the rest of the conference. Thank Thanks. you, Mina. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Sabina, Sean, Helen, and Andy. Um, so that's with our kind of the last of our kind of first part of the day. Uh, so we're going to take a break for about 10 minutes or so. And after the break, we're going to come back. Warner Losh is going to give kind of a laid back talk. Um, he's going to talk about Unix history. Um, and so it's just kind of our time to hang out and uh, listen to what Warner's going to say in about 10 minutes. Uh, but for now, let's take a break. Um, if you need to use the facilities or whatnot, or go hang out in the hallway track. And we'll be back here in about 10 minutes. <laughs>